All right, it is officially 51 o'clock. Time for an overview. What is 51? In a nutshell, 51 is an open source tool for building high quality data sets and high quality models. 51 allows you to visualize your data, clean it, curate it, understand it and find hidden structure, evaluate models, and so much more. 51 is flexible and customizable, and it's connected to the greater machine learning and computer vision ecosystem. At the heart of 51 is curation. 51 allows you to curate your data set by finding subsets of interest, filtering down to those, sorting by specific properties, matching on specific criteria, and selecting data that fits your needs. In this example, we can see that using the UI in the 51 app, we can sort by a property called uniqueness, which is a measure of the uniqueness of each image with respect to the entire data set. And once we've done that, we can actually filter all of our predictions by prediction confidence using a slider. Here's another example. In this example, we're using a selector to filter by specific label classes in our data. We're filtering for airplanes in this particular example, and then after that, we are filtering for high confidence predictions once again. 51 can also help you to remove problems in your data, whether those are duplicate labels, duplicate samples entirely, or something else. In this example, we are sorting by uniqueness again, and we are looking at low uniqueness samples. Now, if there are low uniqueness samples, there's a high probability that those are duplicates in some way. And in this example, we can see that there are indeed a couple of duplicates. And we are tagging them as such so that we can pass them on to 51's labeling and annotation integrations with CVAT, Label Studio, or LabelBox. You can also add to your data. In this example, we are adding tags to these samples that are selected. But you can also add predictions, metadata, or new attributes. And when you're looking through your data, you're filtering, visualizing the data, specific subsets of it, and you happen to find mistakes, you can also correct those mistakes with 51. So in this example here, we see that we are filtering for dogs, and we happen to find a couple of spurious predictions of dogs. And in this case, we can tag them as such, tag them as mistakes in this case, and then later we can correct them. And once you've found, filtered, matched, selected, added it, removed, and corrected mistakes in your data, you can save views in your data so that later on, you can look at that particular view without recreating the entire sequence of logic. In this example here, we are saving a view has people corresponding to a set of our data that has person labels in it. And later on, via the app or via the Python SDK, which we'll talk about shortly, you can access that particular subset of data via the name for the view has people. Moving beyond curation, 51 also helps you to more deeply understand your data. Now, the first part of this is aggregate statistics. Just as you would expect from any data processing library in Python, 51 supports all of your favorite built-in aggregations, from mean standard deviation to looking at the bounds, the min and max in the data, as well as histogram values. In this example here on the left, we are pulling up a histograms panel in the app and looking at histograms for specific properties. In addition to aggregate statistics, 51 also helps you to more deeply understand your data via embeddings. Embeddings are kind of like the multi-tools of machine learning. They're used all over the place in computer vision and machine learning more broadly. Now, in this example, we've computed embeddings for all the images in our data set, and then we have dimensionality reduced them using a technique called UMAP. And what you see here in the panel is a 2D representation of our data via those embeddings. And we can color those embeddings by specific attributes. And then we can actually filter. We can lasso select a certain subset or cluster of those embeddings and see the images that correspond to that cluster. In this case, the particular cluster that we selected happens to correspond to plated food. Here's another example with embeddings. Now, in this example, we're using some images from the Berkeley Deep Drive dataset. These images were taken either during the day, at night, or dawn or dusk. And we've computed embeddings for these images and once again used dimensionality reduction in order to visualize in two dimensions what these embeddings 
and the structure of our data looks like. By doing this, we're able to see some pretty interesting clustering. When we color by the time of day, when the image was taken, we can see that we roughly get two clusters. One cluster corresponding to daytime images, and the other corresponding to nighttime. We also have some other interesting clusters. For instance, one of the clusters corresponds to images with a very prominent windshield. Another corresponds to images with raindrops. And then we can see something even more. We can also see that there's a couple of data points within the daytime cluster that are colored as night, and there's a couple of points within the nighttime cluster that are colored as day. Now, at this point, we could go into this. We could uh, zoom in to our embeddings plot and lasso select those particular examples and understand what is going on with them. Maybe the daytime images were just dark. Maybe there was a lot of cloud coverage that day, and the image looked like a nighttime image. Using this information, we could go and correct those mistakes potentially in our data or account for those edge cases in our model. Another thing worth noting is that visuals in 51 are interactive. This is a key principle of 51, interactivity. In the embeddings plots that we saw, we saw that you could lasso select a particular cluster of embeddings and see in the sample grid the images corresponding to those particular points in the embeddings plot show up. But this extends to other visuals in 51 as well. In this example, we have a bunch of images that have a geolocation attribute associated with them. This can be the location where they're taken or something else entirely. And looking in the map plot, we can select a particular region within the graph, within this map, and see the images corresponding to those locations pop up in the 51 app. Now, speaking of interactivity, let's take a quick moment to test what we've learned so far with a pop quiz. With embeddings in 51, which of the following can you do? A, pre-label data. B, send annotation jobs. C, find likely annotation mistakes. Or D, fine-tune models. Just take a moment. And the answer is A and C. With embeddings in 51, you can uncover hidden structure. And you can use that hidden structure, that rough clustering, to pre-label data or to find potential mistakes, as we saw in the Berkeley Deep Drive dataset example. Now, with 51, you can also send annotation jobs. 51 integrates with Label Studio, Labelbox, and CVAT. And 51 can also be integrated with your fine-tuning pipelines. But embeddings, in particular, are used explicitly for pre-labeling and finding likely annotation mistakes. How about another pop quiz? With embeddings in 51, which of the following can you do? A, find the most similar samples. B, search through images with natural language. C, search through object patches, the detection patches within an image. D, find the most unique samples. And E, find exact duplicates. Take another moment. The answer is A through D. So in the beginning, in the teaser at the very beginning of this workshop, I showed you a few visuals. One was finding cats by clicking on a cat image and searching for similar cat images. That used embeddings. And in the next teaser, I showed you searching through your data set using natural language to find animals. That was also using embeddings. In that example, we were using a clip model, which has multimodal embeddings, so it embeds both images and text. And we were searching for the image embeddings that most closely matched the text embedding for the text animal. You can also search through object patches and find unique samples using embeddings. Now, this is a bit of a trick question because you can also find exact duplicates with 51. 51 has deduplication helpers. That just doesn't explicitly use embeddings. The last component to understanding your data more deeply using 51 is evaluation. And 51 supports all of your favorite evaluation routines, whether they're one number metrics like precision, recall, F1 score, mean average precision, or intersection over union, IOU. It also has interactive plots for PR curves, rock curves, or confusion matrices. And you can do analysis on the level of labels, samples, or the entire data set. In this example on the right, 
we are running an evaluate detections routine that will evaluate our predictions with respect to a ground truth field. And then we are visualizing those predictions via a confusion matrix within the 51 app. Here's another example that shows you how interactive even these confusion matrices can be. In this example, we are selecting a particular square, a particular cell in our confusion matrix, in particular, the square that corresponds to people that were correctly identified as people, and we are seeing those particular samples pop up in the sample grid. As I mentioned at the very top, 51 is flexible, customizable, and connected. 51 recognizes in its principles that computer vision and machine learning are not one-size-fits-all fields. As such, 51 is built to facilitate your workflows, whatever those may be. One part of that is the data. Now, 51 helps you to build higher quality data sets so that you can build higher quality models. A key component of that is making it as easy as possible to work with your data to get it into 51 and out of 51 as such, 51 supports a variety of common dataset formats, everything from COCO and VOC to Kitty, uh, and it even integrates with natively CVAT and a bunch of other common formats. Here you can see a listing on the right-hand side. Uh, additionally, 51 has built-in support for video dataset formats, point cloud formats, and a bunch of others. The same flexibility extends to models. You can bring your own models, whether you're working in PyTorch, SK Learn, TensorFlow, or some other machine learning framework, or you can use one of the models that is already built to integrate with 51 in our 51 model zoo. The same flexibility extends to the media types that are utilized and enabled by 51. In some of the datasets that we've seen so far, I've showed you images and videos as well as geo data, but 51 also works with point clouds and even DICOM data among a variety of other formats. So DICOM is useful in medical fields. Uh, geodata could be useful if you are looking for things that happened in particular places. Point clouds are useful in a lot, of, a lot of autonomous vehicle applications. And you may have also seen point clouds in a bunch of generative applications recently using OpenAI's Pointy. Uh, and you can also group data of different modalities together in 51 grouped data sets. We'll show you some examples of that shortly. And finally, this flexibility also extends to labels. There are so many different tasks in computer vision and machine learning, from the classic image-based tasks like image classification and object detection, to multimodal tasks like text-to-image generation and visual question answering. 51 has label types that help you to perform these tasks and to manipulate and work with data for all of these different workflows everything from detections to instance and semantic segmentation masks to key points to action recognition and relationships and so much more. And if the pre-built flexibility within 51, the, the defaults, is not quite what you need, have no fear. 51 is also highly customizable. In this example here, we see a very simple example of that customizability where you can create groups for attributes in the filter bar, and you can move around those attributes into different groups. But the customizability goes so much further. At the heart of customizability in 51 are plugins. Plugins allow you to extend 51's flexibility and functionality in a variety of ways. You can write plugins in Python that allow you to perform a certain block of code by a single operation. You can even write a plugin that enables you to add buttons or entire panels to the apps. Think model evaluation panels. Here's another example of a plugin within 51. In the teaser, I showed you VoxelGPT. VoxelGPT is also a plugin. So VoxelGPT, with all of its docs querying and dataset querying capabilities, the chatbot-like interface, all of that is implemented as a plugin within 51. Now let's take a step back here and talk about how 51 fits into the larger data science, machine learning, and computer vision space. 51 sits at the intersection of data and models. It helps you to build higher quality data sets so that you can train higher quality models. You can bring your own data from whatever data provider, and you can bring your own model from whatever model provider. 51 allows you to harmonize the two. 
And 51 is connected with the larger landscape of data and machine learning platforms and tools out there. Everything from your data and data labeling tools to notebooks and cloud providers, all the way to models and experiment tracking and even vector search tools. 51 is integrated with all of these and serves as the source of truth for your data as you are working with all of these different platforms and tools. So far, we've been using the term 51 rather loosely. But to be more specific, what I've been referring to as 51 is actually comprised of three pillars. The 51 library, the 51 app, and the 51 brain. The 51 library, what I refer to as just 51 from now on, is the Python library, the software development kit, SDK. It is the open source framework that allows you to query your data and perform these operations via Python code on your data. You can think of it kind of like a debugger for computer vision data. On the right-hand side, you can see an example of some 51 code. And this, this code creates a sample, it creates a data set, adds tags to the sample, and does a bunch of other things. This code is written with the 51 library. All right, let's test our knowledge once again. Where can you use 51? A, within a Python script. B, in a Python interpreter. C, in a Jupyter notebook. Or D, from the command line. The answer is all of the above. You can use the 51 library wherever you can write Python code, whether that's in a Python script, the Python interpreter, or a Jupyter notebook. And 51 actually works in a wider variety of notebooks as well. You can use it in Colab or even as I do very often within a VS Code IPython notebook. But 51 also works from the command line. And if you go to the 51 docs, there's an entire section detailing how to work with 51 from the command line. The 51 app is a graphical user interface, or GUI, for your computer vision data. It's an application, and you can think of it kind of like VS Code for your data. All of the images and GIFs that I've showed you so far have actually been taken from the 51 app. All right, let's test our understanding again. Where can you view the 51 app? A, a Python script. B, Python interpreter. C, Jupyter Notebook, D, as a standalone desktop app, or E, in your browser? The answer is C through E. You can view the 51 app in a Jupyter Notebook, in a cell, in the output of a cell of a Jupyter Notebook. You can also view it as a standalone desktop app. To do that, you have to install it in a slightly separate way, which we'll go over in the installation part of this workshop. And you can view it in your browser, you can launch it via a local host and view it in a tab in your browser. This is a bit of a trick question, though, because you can also launch the 51 app from a Python script or from the Python interpreter. The 51 app can be launched from any of these places. It can just only be visualized in C3E. And the 51 brain is the suite of machine learning powered routines that allow you to dig into your data and understand it better. This includes everything relating to embeddings, similarity, dimension reduction, and visualization. Everything I've showed you so far, 51 and the whole package that goes along with that, is open source. And if you're a single developer working locally on your laptop, that's likely all you need. But if you are working as part of a larger team and you need versioning, permissioning, and collaboration tools, you might need 51 Teams. 51 Teams is built on top of 51 open source and provides all of these things.